Our guest today is F. William Engdahl, who is a best-selling author. I would consider his first book a classic, A Century of War. Um, it's sort of being made into a documentary, I believe. Uh, Sean Stone, the son of uh, Oliver Stone, the filmmaker, is releasing a, a documentary on Russia today, uh, very soon, called A Century of War. Uh, William Engdahl has also written Seeds of Destruction, uh, Gods of Money, as well as uh, his latest book, which we'll be talking about, The Lost Hegemon, uh, Whom the Gods Would Destroy. His books have been translated into over a dozen uh, languages, and he is, he is a consultant who travels, uh, travels the world. Thank you for joining us, William. I'm always glad to be with you. Well, a student told me today uh, that today was the grand finale of America, to which I thought he was speaking of some Netflix TV show but he was jokingly referring to the end of the American uh, democratic experiment because we have oh. elections today. And uh, that's kind of the theme uh, in the title of your latest book, The Lost uh, Hegemon. And uh, you hold up the, the cover of the book because uh, it's so important, a little bit higher. There we go. Uh, let me explain the cover. The Lost Hegemon, of course, is the United States post-1945, hegemon controlling pretty much the whole world, but uh, indirectly, indirectly. And the lost hegemon, the flag is purportedly from the wreckage of the World Trade Twin Towers, or Three Towers. And that more or less symbolizes the state of the United States of America today. The democracy so-called has become an oligarchy in my lifetime, but certainly in the last, uh, let's say, 35 years, since the 1980s. Every major law passed by the United States Congress has benefited the 1%. This has been documented by a Princeton sociology professor who analyzed all the major pieces of legislation, the Obamacare medical insurance, the beneficiaries are a handful of medical insurance companies who are charging rates through the roof, not the uninsured or the people of the United States. It's a, a looting scam. Uh, most of the laws passed since 1980 are passed on the interest of people like David Rockefeller, like Warren Buffett, like Bill Gates. And they're not in the interests of the American people. So this American democracy, uh, I call it whom the gods would destroy is the subtitle. The book is actually about uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. And this is very, very timely right now because as I wrote in a piece that was published on the website NEO out of, out of Moscow a few days ago, the real Humagate scandal is the Muslim Brotherhood. The 650,000 emails that the FBI uncovered in the laptop of Huma Abedin, the person closest to Hillary Clinton for 20 years. I won't go into details of what's alleged about the closeness. I'll just say that she has a very special relation to Hillary Clinton, an intimate intelligence relation where she has access to everything that Hillary had access to, and including the illegal servers, the private servers. 650,000 emails. Well, Huma Abedin is a member of something called the Muslim Sisterhood, which is the female arm of the Muslim Brotherhood. What is the Muslim Brotherhood? The book is about this. It's the, the leitmotif of the entire book. The Muslim Brotherhood was created as a co-project of certain circles in Egypt in the 1920s, Hassan al-Banna, but by British intelligence also. And it's a death cult. It claims to be about the good ideas of Quran and Islam and so forth, but it's a death cult. Death in the name of Allah is the highest honor. Killing infidels is the highest honor. This is in the teachings of the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood. When Mohammed Morsi, under the operation that Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State, launched, called the Arab Spring in Egypt, when Mohammed Morsi became president of the 
uh, of, of Egypt, Muslim Brotherhood, that was a United States, a Washington guided operation to put in an organization, a secret society, a death cult that was guided and steered by the Central Intelligence Agency in the U.S. Department since the 1950s. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just to, just to step back a bit, because uh, you know, I, I, there's other books. People, you know, this is really good, and it's very timely, as as you mentioned, and other books that I've purchased as a result of your reference. Uh, you've referenced the Richard Mitchell, the Society of the Muslim uh, Brothers, and the Devil's Game by Dreyfus. Um, but was when it was created at the beginning, was it? You said with British intelligence, but who had the founding role? I mean, were these radical Muslims, did they create it first for their ideological purposes and then the Brit British came in? Or? It has nothing to do with religion, I'm convinced. It's very secretive, so it's difficult to, to know. But if you read the writings of Hassan al-Banna and what he commanded his people to do, my suspicion is that it was a project of the Vatican. That's my suspicion. It's too sophisticated for a small town school teacher, Hassan al-Banna, in a remote village in Egypt to have created this three-level structure. I think it has nothing to do with religion per se. It has to do with organized murder. Like Meyer Lansky. I wouldn't call Meyer Lansky a Jew. I would call him an organized murderer. Murder Incorporated was what his organization was called. But he was a friend of Israel. He had this desire to have some more benign status than just the head of Murder Incorporated. So we're dealing with a death cult. We're dealing with killing energy. And it has nothing to do with religion. Or maybe, maybe that's what all religion is about. Catholic, Jewish, Orthodox. Maybe that's what all religion is about. I don't know. I'm not a person of religion. The Muslim Brotherhood, the, the important point about the Muslim Brotherhood is who picks it up. In the 30s, during the Hitler time, the Brotherhood was driven out of Egypt by the British, apparently if there was this connection that I alleged or referred to, at a certain point they had a falling out. Like all creations, you know, you want to do your own thing and don't want to have some British intelligence uh, handler tell you what to do. So they went into exile, including the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. They went into exile in Berlin after 1933, 39. And that was the Berlin of Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany. And the Grand Mufti, who was a leading member of the Muslim Brotherhood, the spiritual leader of Jerusalem, worked with... Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, he writes in his memoirs, he told Hitler, the one condition that we have to work with you is that you allow us to kill each and every Jew in Palestine. And Hitler said to me, that's yours. So this gives you an idea of the, the moral quality of the Brotherhood. Now, when, when Morsi became president, and the Muslim Brotherhood dominated the parliament because they were the only organized force after the collapse of the Mubarak uh, regime. They were the only organized force. And Washington made sure that the elections were pushed immediately. There was a debate in the parliament. He heard it with his own ears. Some months after Morsi became president and the Muslim Brotherhood controlled the parliament. How long after the death of a Muslim wife is it still acceptable under Islamic law to have sex with the dead body of the dead wife? Wow. This is no exaggeration. This is coprophilia. This is a death cult. The CIA locked into this in the 1950s. They discovered it in, in uh, Munich of all places, Munich, Germany, close to where I live. They found a Nazi network that was called the, I forget the name now, but it's in the book, uh, but they dealt with the eastern areas, but with 
Muslims recruited from the territory of the Soviet Union. There are many, many nominal Muslims in the, in the Soviet Union then. And the Nazis recruited them because they realized they have such ferocity to kill. So they were picked up by the Nazis after the end of the war. They went, went back to Egypt and Palestine and so forth. And when, they, when the Brotherhood attempted to assassinate Gamal Abdel Nasser, the president of Egypt, and failed, they were driven underground. Miles Copeland, the CIA station chief in Cairo, smuggled the leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood out of Egypt into Saudi Arabia. And there began the fateful, I call it marriage made in hell, between the Muslim Brotherhood with the Wahhabi strain of Islam in Saudi Arabia, which is befitting a 18th century camel herding Bedouin culture. And that is not a very high level of culture. And, and so can, can we say that the beginnings were the, the connecting thread would be the, the Brotherhood um, yeah. and then the intelligence networks of Britain and, and the West and then from here springs Al Qaeda and later ISIS. To but, complete, no, to complete. I would say it differently. I would say after the war, the move to bring by the CIA to bring the Brotherhood into Saudi Arabia created a marriage between the Brotherhood and Wahhabism, this ultra ultra reactionary feudalistic Muslim ideology where women to show more than the eyes is to be an obscene whore. Uh, talk about repressed women and to drive a car to walk down the street without a relative, a male relative at your side means you're a whore, a prostitute. Uh, this is a pretty sick belief structure. I won't call it a religion. It's a sick belief structure, but the belief structure happens to have or had until recently hundreds of billions of dollars of oil money. <clears throat> so what happened after the 50s and the 60s is that Saudi money financed the creation of the Muslim World League in Jeddah. And the Muslim World League was the evangelical, if you want to call it that, arm of the Muslim Brotherhood going out into Pakistan, into Afghanistan, into all over the Islamic world where it was possible. And that is what precisely gave birth to the Mujahideen, the CIA project called Operation Cycle. And, and uh, indeed, uh, uh, the last guest that we spoke to was Annie Macon, the MI5 uh, whistleblower. Um, oh. And she confirmed that in the 90s, you know, that's one reason she quit because she saw MI6 uh, directly funding Al Qaeda. And so, you know, they tell us that was just the 80s thing, but they continued this relationship. It just they, it seems they never discontinued this relationship. Um, ISIS today is supported by the United States government, by John Kerry, the State Department, by um, the CIA, Kabul. Uh, Al Nusra Front is Al Qaeda. They're supported by the CIA. Any person who wants to kill in the name of destroying. Syria and destroying stability in Syria, Bashar al-Assad, is so-called moderate Islam. And they're all out of this. Uh, you can trace the genealogy. That's what the book is all about, the lost hegemon. And what, what has happened, the reason it's a lost hegemon is they're losing power. They're not able to accomplish what they used to think they could accomplish in their wars. They lose every war. The patriarchs, the oligarchs that are believing that America is their tool, their machine to kill and create power in the world, they're losing. This is the good news. Mm -hmm. They're losing everywhere. After almost six years, they have not been able to get rid of Bashar al-Assad. Now there's coming a coalescence of interests, China, Russia, Iran, Syria, of course, Lebanon now, with the new election of the president, that 
is opposed to this insanity where one nation dictates to everybody what size shoe you will have, what color tie you will wear, what color hair you will have, what belief you will have, and damn you if you don't, we'll kill you. That era is over. The American century has collapsed. Like the British Empire collapsed a hundred years before. So uh, I can't stress this enough. If any of your students are compelled to to challenge this and do their own investigation, that would make me enormously happy. It's out there to discover. Mm -hmm. And you've written in your last articles of the unstoppable Eurasian uh, century and the new Israel, Russia, Turkey uh, energy alignment. We've seen the Philippines. Uh, seemingly realigned with uh, China as well as other Southeast uh, Asian countries. Um, uh, what will this look like in the near uh, future? You think it's going to be, well, history tells us, unfortunately, that it's a bloody transition. Do you see it as peaceful or do you see the lost hegemon starting war with uh, Russia or China? No, there's it's not a chance that they would do that. They can't. They can't. That's the problem. From the United States Department of the Army has $6.5 trillion are unaccountable spending over a period of how many years, they don't say, but the Auditor General, the Inspector General of the Department of Defense made this in a public report on, on their website last, I think it was September, $6.5 trillion go down the rabbit hole, that means corruption is unlike anything the Roman Empire in the fourth century could even dream of. Yeah. The corruption of generals, the corruption of military industry, the corruption of Congress. Why don't you account for what you spend things on? Because you want to hide it. And that China and Russia are cooperating, not on making war not on hacking Hillary Clinton's DNC emails. This is nonsense. This was done as an internal job by dissident factions inside the U.S. What interest is it of, of Vladimir Putin to hack the Democratic National Committee emails? None at all. You know, it's the biggest clown show in the world. And the interesting thing is the world is laughing at America because they don't have the mojo anymore. It's collapsing. That's why I call it the most hegemon. And, uh, and something interesting you mentioned uh, in the book here, you mentioned the Greater Middle East um, Initiative or, or project, and you've got the map here. And yeah. you say it seems like plan A was to use the color revolution model. Um, and then if that failed, well, plan B, unleash uh, Islamic Jihad. Do you think this color revolution template has become so, so obvious now that it's not so useful, as well as the using the uh, ISIS and using unleashing Islamic Jihad. Are are they eventually going to have to end this? Strategy? Well, everything everything is failing. ISIS. There's a group in Syria called the White Helmets, and if you look more closely into the White Helmets, you'll find these are supposedly humanitarian rescuers who save lives of children who were bombed by the Syrian Assad government. In reality, it's an operation funded by the United States government, millions of dollars, by the British government, millions of pounds, by George Soros. I don't know how much he's given to this. It's an American Washington CIA front organization, and they use the same child victims with ketchup smeared over their face in at least three or four different video clips in different cities. The same face. They have such a, a, you know, lack of respect for the intelligence of the people they show this to, that they don't even bother to change the child actors. So this is, you know, this is absurd. They're, they're, they have the level of intelligence of a moron. The neoconservatives, the people behind this in Washington, Ashton Carter, the so-called Secretary of Defense, who's an offensive idiot. Uh, Harvard professor is worth not a dime in my book for someone like Ashton Carter. He's an idiot. He All he can think of is making war. And China, Russia, Iran, other countries 
They're more interested in building up economic development. Trillions of dollars have been spent building economic bridges, not blowing the bridges up like we seem to do so well in Washington. So, if, as you say, they can't go to war with Russia or China, what, what do you see overall for the future of, of America? Well, the unknown factor is to what extent the popular uh, opposition to this globalist agenda that's been rammed down American people's throats since consciously since the 1970s, I would say, uh, how deep that goes. If the American people, regardless, Hillary versus Donald Trump is a choice between evil one and evil two. Donald Trump already has made known that he's going to have a former Goldman Sachs officer and George Soros uh, uh, intimate as his treasury secretary designate if he's elected. He's given the choice of pre-cabinet selections to the same lobby groups in Washington that control the game for Democrat or Republican for the last 30 years. So Donald Trump is a liar. He's a criminal. He's a casino gambling uh, mafia figure. Hillary Clinton is a liar. She's a criminal. Uh, she and her husband have not only peddled influence, they have promoted a death cult and uh, terror and treason all around the world called the Muslim Brotherhood. That is Hillary Clinton. So, plus the fact she is so ill, were she to be uh, deemed the winner in the election, it would be by electoral machine voter fraud, uh, I'm convinced. Were she to be proclaimed like Newsweek did a day early, they made a little tactical slip. Uh, they proclaimed uh, Madam President in a picture of Hillary on the cover. Uh, let me go down in history, however, like the, uh, uh, the Truman Dewey election in 1948, where the, I think it was the Chicago Tribune had a picture of Dewey, who's third of Dewey today, <laughs> but they had Dewey picked as, as the winner. So, uh, but regardless of who wins, the credibility of the United States of America, this is the lost hegemon. The credibility is collapsing. The, the tenor, the, the content of the election campaign, talking about the size of the male sexual organs of Donald Trump because of the size of his hands in the Republican debates, or talking about who's raped how many people as Hillary and, and Donald Trump exchange in their debates. Uh, you know, you can't get lower in the gutter than, than this, but that's because neither candidate can tell the truth about anything that they're talking about. So I think the credibility of America is, is sinking. And what is the open question? Will there be a genuine moral alternative that comes out of this debacle called the 2016 elections. If that is the case, then I think there's great hope for the United States. Yeah, we've got books like The Fourth uh, Turning that tell us about history's cycles and out of crisis. Hopefully we get some sort of uh, reformation or, or, you know, going back to basics. Um, any final closing thoughts or, or comments to Americans or citizens of the world wa watching these events? Closing comment I would make is what I make to myself. I am responsible for everything that happens to me in my life. You are responsible for everything that happens to you in your life. American people are responsible for everything that happens to them in their life. They're responsible if they choose a homicidal maniac as their president. That is their wish. So if we want a better world, we should look at who we are and look at that honestly. If we do that with love, then I'm very optimistic that we can achieve miracles. Right now it looks pretty black. Some people talk about World War III. 
I, for one, refuse to believe that we're on the brink of World War III. It won't happen. I can tell you that right now. Disturbed energy out there is, we're in a phase shift. We're ending an epoch of war and destruction. And that is fading. And so I, I think it's, it's a rather positive perspective if we believe in ourselves. Again, the book is The Lost Hegemon People Can Pick Up, as well as your other books like uh, Gods of Money and Century of War. Um, and finally, how can people best support uh, you and your work? The best is by purchasing the books through Amazon. All over the world, you can get it through Amazon. And go to my website, williamaindahl.com, and there you will find free content of all my published articles. And also, if you agree to subscribe, and, and uh, you can get a free twice-monthly newsletter of excerpts of chapters or parts of chapters from uh, my major books. So there's a donate button. I, I work completely free from any contractual obligation to any employer. I, I work independently. Uh, I've tried the other way and it was a disaster. And I want to be free to be who I am and express what I express. So if you agree with what I say, and more and more people are doing that, then make a donation. Think about making a donation. Buy the books, williamengdahl.com.